So the not conforming, the transforming and renewing of the mind leads to the realizing. And that realizing is knowing the will of God. And that's what it's all about. If you look at the summation of those two verses in terms of what is true worship, true worship ultimately leads us to understanding the will of God. Not conformed, being transformed, having the renewed mind again gives us the ability to know the will of God. And that is the ability to test and prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And it begins with the renewed mind. So if you don't have the renewed mind, you won't know what is the will of God. And the will of God comes, as we spoke about the renewed mind, and we spoke about it last week, that the renewed mind comes from knowing the word of God. And that's the renewal. That's the cleansing process we spoke about last week, the washing of the waters of the word. So now this is something that is, it shouldn't be profound, but if you hang around certain church circles, it seems to be hidden. But scripture clearly tells us that God's word isn't hidden. God's word is revealed. That's what he does for us in his word. His word is clearly a revelation. And we know that. The word revelation, for those of you that are studying the book of Revelation on the Tuesday night, the word revelation means to uncover, to unveil, and to reveal. The Greek word is apocalypsis. And that's what it means. I mean, I hear some people that, or some Christians that will say, oh, Revelation is such a hard book, and that sort of, no, it's not. Because Revelation means to reveal. Now, interestingly, well-known Satanists that have come to the Lord and have become ministers of the gospel, they have shared that one of the books, or the main books in the Bible, that Satanists regularly pray to their guy upstairs, or downstairs, I think he's downstairs, for Christians not to read. Guess which book Satanists don't want Christians to read? Revelation. Why? Because verse 3, 1, 3, chapter 1, verse 3 in Revelation says, there is a blessing to those that read this book. And it's an unveiling, it's an opening. And I spoke to you about this. One of the things that I, I don't like to do is that if I watch, if I recorded my, my soccer team that has played uh, you know, during the early hours of the morning in England, and if I look at the results and if I've seen that they lost the game, I don't want to watch the highlights. But if they won the game, then I'm all eager, you know, I want to watch the game because I know the results that they won. And similar for us as Christians, Revelations is the highlights package. It shows us that what? We've won. Our God has won. And that's why the devil does not want us to read it. He does not want us to read the Bible. And therefore, it's important that we create that. I love that the Williams family... Uh, starting on that uh, campaign uh, to read the Bible, um, Elsa and John. So when we look at the words there in the Greek, just to unpack that, the word good, what does the word good mean? The word good originates from God because nothing is good unless you have God as your moral framework. God is the foundation. If you do not know God, then you cannot decide or def understand what is good. So when the book of Romans is speaking about proving what is that good. Ultimately, I mean, James 1.17 says, all good gifts come down from the Father of light. So anything good comes down from God in that sense. So therefore, the will of God starts off with God. The word acceptable speaks about approving. What is the good? What is the approving will of God? And then the word perfect. What is perfect? What is the perfect will of God? I mean, that word perfect does not mean spotless in the sense that you don't make mistakes. It means that you got everything all together. That word perfect in the Greek means coming to maturity, coming to completion. That I'm not there yet, but I'm a work in progress. And that's important. You know, I, I shared this with the, my families and friends. Our, the Subrian household was busy on the sports field yesterday. Zipporah was in the netball. Uh, Jethro was in the soccer. Jethro, Zipporah's team did phenomenally well. 47-12, they won. Jethro's team, not so good. But I had him training after that, going through some trials and drills and stuff like that there. And I put a video uh, to my family and I said, uh, his team lost, but next week he's going to understand that, you know, he's going to get better. And the thing is, I don't have a problem with losing. I don't have a problem with Christians coming short. I don't have, because I come short. But I guess it's a problem when we're satisfied with losing. 
When I mean losing, I mean we're satisfied with not coming up to the mark that God wants us to come up to. And that's a problem. If we are satisfied with not giving God our best, then it's a challenge. Because when Christ died on the cross, he gave everything. And because he gave everything, that's out of love, not out of compulsion. We should strive to give our best in that respect. So when we look at the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, it's not saying that we will always be in the perfect will of God. Because the perfect will of God is that which pleases God. The Greek word is telema. Telema te, theos, comes from God. And that's what pleases God. Psalms 37 verse 4 says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and ye shall give you the desires of your heart. So this God is not standing with a big stick ready to whack you if you do something wrong. He's encouraging. He wants to give you his best. And his best comes from obedience. We are called to walk in the word. We are called to follow the word. We are called to be obedient to what God has said. I love what Andrew Murray said. Andrew Murray said, be a soldier that asks for nothing but the orders of the commander. How powerful is that? You know, you find that there are some churches that have prophetic conferences. Come and hear a word from God. Come and hear the will of God. Come and know the will of God. There's even courses. Five steps to knowing the will of God. There's even three keys for knowing the will of God. Attend this conference and you know the, the will of God. And as I've said, the will of God is in the word. It's revealed here. And it reminds me of when I was a, when I was a Hindu. You know, when I was a Hindu, you'd get some of these Hindu priests or priestesses and they'd get what they call a trance. And that's the opportunity now for us to all come before this holy person so that they can tell you your future. You know? But obviously there'll be a tray there. And before they tell you the future, you've got to put something in the tray. Preferably notes, you know, with the queen's face on it or something like that there. And then they tell you your future. And similarly, in Christendom, some, some sex, some part of Christendom has that mentality. That I want to know what God's will for my life is. So I'll go to this conference. I'll go and hear this person. And look for that there. I mean, that's like, that's like fortune telling. And we have it in God's word. If you obey God's word. You know, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he shall direct your paths. That's all what God wants you to do. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. You know that my background is, is sports psychology and mental coaching. One of the basic things, if, if their kids are playing a ball sport, anybody's playing a ball sport, what you got to do? Keep your on the ball. Simple. Keep your eye on the ball. That's what you got to do. As a Christian, you keep your eye on Jesus through the word of God. Hebrews 12 tells us that there. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Focusing our attention on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. It's so easy. Easy as in... All God wants is our obedience. But obviously, we've got an adversary, we've got a foe, and he's around the corner always lurking to, to sort of dispel the will of God in our lives. But if you look at the verse that I wanted to, to share with you guys on, the part that speaks a bit more, I've deliberately held the word prove back, and I've started with good, acceptable, and perfect, and the will of God. You see, this word prove is, is very, very powerful. In its original context. The Greek word is dokimazo. And what it means is, it means to test, to examine, to prove, to scrutinize whether it is genuine, good or not. And that's what God is saying through his word. That when you are presenting your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord. When you are not being conformed to the world. When you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to prove what is the perfect, good, and acceptable will of God? But if you're not having that process, if you're not immersing yourself in that process that God has set before us, you would not be able to prove, you would not be able to test, examine, and scrutinize, and to know what is the will of God. Now, this is what God is saying. He's calling us to test. He's calling us to be able to examine. Not that we just take everything in and just accept everything. He's calling us to test. Now, importantly, there's another word that describes this word, to prove and it's refine. 1 Peter 1 7 tells us that God is calling us to be purified, to be refined in the fire like gold and silver. And that's why I've got those pictures there. I've got that word in that gold color. Because we know when gold is mined, 
I don't know if you guys know anything about mining in this part of the world, do you? Yeah. You know, when gold is mined, for those of you listening on audio, I've said that tongue in cheek because there's a lot of mines here. And the thing is, when gold is mined from the earth, it's, before it gets to the jeweler shop or the end product, it needs to be purified. It needs to be refined. I remember as a little boy growing up in South Africa, and we'd have the, the news, and around the news time, you'll have the financial news that comes up, and they'll have this image of the gold getting poured in the hot fire. Do you remember that? Yeah? And, and you get the gold getting poured in this, in this real furnace. And that's the picture that this word dokimazo should bring to your mind. It's about gold being refined in the furnace, in the fire. Because why? When it's mined out of the earth, it's impure. It has a bit of other metals in it. And the way that you remove those metals is by putting that gold through the furnace. And when you look at that, I mean, when you think about the imagery of furnace, I can't get out of my mind the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what they were done, they were put into the furnace. And in the furnace, where was God? The fourth person was there. And that's so powerful because when, when you go into the furnace, when you go into the fire, you know, God is putting us there not to destroy us, but he's putting us in there to come forth as pure gold, to be separated from the impurity and the counterfeit, the things that get into us that are from the world. And that's important. Remember that word counterfeit, because I'm going to speak a bit more about that. But that's what God is wanting us to understand, that when you are having the renewed mind, when you are led by the word of God and his spirit, you will then be able to prove, to test, to scrutinize, to know what is the perfect will of God. That when people come to you and say, hey, here's the will of God there in all of these signs and wonders, or here's the will of God here in all of the things that are heresies and that are not aligned to the word of God, you know straight away that cannot be the will of God. So with that in mind, there's another verse in scripture, 1 John 4, 1. But this verse says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they, are, whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Oh, but Mayan, no, we can't do that, Mayan, because that's not nice. We can't, we can't test people. We can't put them under the spotlight because, you know, the Bible says, touch not the anointed. You'll hear that. You'll hear that as, a, as an excuse not to hold preachers, ministers of the gospel, or any, anybody for that matter that is misinterpreting scripture. But here it's that same word, dokimazo, coming in the form of testing the spirits. God's word is encouraging us to test the spirits, to know whether they are from God or not. Because again, whether you realize it or not, there's false prophets around. There are false teachers that are teaching a different gospel. And therefore, we need to be in the word. So God is giving us a warning. Now, it goes on to speak about, there's another place where that word uh, Dokimazo is used again. And, and if you've got your Bibles, if you want to turn there, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, the Bible tells us how often we should test the spirits. You know what it says? All the time. All the time we are called to test the spirits. Now, sometimes you may, you may get uh, you know, the, to the situation where you just believe things hook, line, and sinker. And God has not called us to be those hook, line, and sinker believers. He's called us to be like the Bereans. We need to be able to test what the word of God says. Now, I spoke to you a few weeks back and I said, I'm going to cover this uh, later on. Well, this is later on. Hebrews 4.12. And Hebrews 4.12, as a believer, you've got you to hold on to these. The, one of, you know, this is one of the scriptures that we need to really hold on to. Because Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of the soul, spirit of joints and marrow, and he's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now, I've got some words up there in yellow because I want to unpack that a bit more. It says that the word of God is living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. What does a sword do? It, it pierces. It pierces. Now, the word piercing in the Greek speaks about going through, reaching through, penetrating. And that's an encouragement for us, that God's word can penetrate through the darkest, hardened heart. No matter how dire, no matter how diabolical, no matter how forlorn, 
and helpless the situation seems, God's word is like that sword, that two-edged sword that pierces right through, right through, even to the division of the soul, spirit of joints and marrow. Now, what does that mean, division? That's the word I spoke to you about, merismos. That, that division speaks about a partitioning, a dividing. It's, it really opens you up. It splits you up. Last week, I spoke about uh, Chris Barna, Dr. Chris Barna, the first heart transplant that was done, was done by him. And when they do a heart transplant, open heart surgery, I know nowadays they do non-invasive, but if it needs to be, they split you right open. And that's the image of being split right open. And that's what God's word does. So you can hide, you can put on a facade, you can put on a mask, but God's word gets through all of that. It pierces and then it opens up and it partitions. I've said this many times already, and if you haven't heard it, I want to tell you now. Whatever I say and whatever I speak to people is on the record. I don't have secret squirrels. If you want to quote me on anything, you quote me. Because you know why? We need to come to the realization that everything we say, God sees. I know it sounds ludicrous, but sometimes we forget that. We forget that God knows everything. And, and we want to have these secret squirrel things, and we want to have this closet stuff, and, and that's where I say, whatever I say is on the record, because I know that I'm going to be held accountable to it. Maybe not on earth, but when I stand before God. And I've said that, I've said that a few times, when I've caught out people that were lying through their teeth, and some of them were Christians. And I, and I, and I would get up to them, and I would say to them, I want you to understand something. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, that we all have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. To do what? To give an account. I said, I have to stand there. You have to stand there. So I want you to understand something. You may think you're getting away with it now. By tarring my name, slandering me, or making me the scapegoat. But understand this here. I take solace and I take comfort in knowing that we all have to stand before God's judgment seat and give an account. I said, my prayer is that you realize that before you go to stand before your maker. And I'm saying it with a smile on my face. I'm not saying it with bitterness. Or, but I'm, I'm just wanting to encourage us. And that is why we spoke about it last week. That the renewed mind realizes that if you said something, if you've done something that is not pleasing to God or, or deceitful or whatever, understand that God sees it all. Because the next part says that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And that word to discern speaks about being critical, exposing, laying bare. That's what God's word does. Now you may say, oh man, that's, that's so critical, that's so harsh. You know what the Greek word is for the discerner? It is kritikos. Kritikos. It is from that word kritikos that we get critical, we get criticism. And in its pure form, when it says the word of God is a discerner, it says that it is related to what? Say it a little bit louder. It is related to? Oh, but Christians can't judge. Oh, judge not that you be not judged. That is an absolute heresy. It is an absolute lie. We are called to judge. Not by our standards, but by the word of God. We are called to judge. If people tell you not to judge, you need to talk to them and show them the scriptures. Because scripture was given for the discernment, for the judging. And like I said again, disclaimer, don't judge by your standards, judge by God's standards. And this is where we need to look at the length and breadth of scripture. Because scripture always confirms scripture. We can't take things out of isolation. People say, oh, but didn't Jesus say in Matthew 7, don't judge unless you be judged? Yeah, yeah, he said that. But he also said, take out the plank from your eye that you may be able to see clearly the speck in your brother's eye. If you're an alcoholic, and if you're not repented, and in the sense you haven't redeemed yourself, how can you go give another alcoholic guy advice? Hey, you need to give up drinking. Eh? You need to give up drinking. You know, or if you are sinning in a particular area that that person is sinning in, it's hypocritical. That's what Jesus means when he says, judge not that he be judged. He means sort your life out first before you go and tell somebody else to sort that matter out in their life. We've got to understand that. You know, it's like we are in this world today 
Lance and I are going to write a book today. Uh, not today, but very soon. We're going to call it uh, The Yoke of the Woke. Because today society is yoked by the woke. And we need to awoke. Yeah, we need to awake. Yeah, but you understand. It's poetic lesson. <laughs> What is the woke culture today? The woke culture today is to cancel anything that is good, anything that is acceptable, anything that is in the perfect will of God. And you, I've seen it. I've seen recently this week, there was a men's conference where they thought, the pastor that organized it taught nothing of having a male stripper in that conference, in the men's conference, up the pole. And this male stripper was actually someone that frequented gay bars. And when they uncovered it, this guy was a practicing Buddhist. And this pastor defends, so the, the pastor that was going to speak had the power of God to come up and rebuke that and say what took place here was not godly, was not good. And as he was doing that, the pastor who organized the event says, you're out of line, you're out of line, get off the stage. And he humbly says, okay, fine, I'll leave the stage. And then after that, the pastor who organized the event is making excuses. And he's saying, oh no, that guy is a Christian. How dare that pastor rebuke him, my fellow brother in Christ and blah, blah, blah. But then now comes out all the evidence that is hidden in plain sight that this guy that was up the pole was a practicing Buddhist. There's videos of him going into a Buddhist temple and doing all of that. What is my point? My point is that we are called to judge. We are called to speak out. But now what has happened the woke society has decided to cancel the pastor that came out and spoke the word of God. And he, he's, the pastor that hosted the event is actually making an appeal to people that follow this pastor to say, stop following him. Have nothing to do with him. If I could take you back in time to when King David was caught in the act of adultery. And let's say there was a woke agenda there. And the word of God came to the prophet Nathan. And what did the word of God say to the prophet Nathan? Go and call David out. And if Nathan was a woke prophet, he would be like, oh, sorry, I can't do that. But God, as long as he's being a good king, you know, he's still doing his kingly duties. He can still carry on in doing, God, I can't do that. That's not PC. That's not right. And what has happened is that that culture, if we hold on to that culture, it is not pleasing God. Because Nathan went up to David, the king, the, the highest authority in the land. I mean, David could have had him executed. And Nathan went there and said, Thus saith the Lord, thou art the man. And what has happened is that we've become so withdrawn. We've become so culturally blended into the environment that we don't want to say anything because of fear, fearing for our safety, fearing for, I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, we can be afraid of our safety, but you know, our well being, whether we're going to keep our jobs, whether we're going to be able to still do what we do. But where is your reliance? Your reliance should be on God. And this is what the Word of God is saying to us that God has called us to know and to prove and to test what is the will of God. The emperor's new clothes was such a good example, eh? The emperor was naked, but everybody was like, whoa. Beautiful clothes. Well done, Emperor. You're looking so wonderful. And then the little child said, hey, the guy's naked. And, and God is calling us to have that childlike faith. To call things out in love. Again, in love. We sang lovely songs. Good theme as well. In love. That's what God has called us to do. Charles, but now I've, I've got to put a disclaimer. The next slide is non-vegan friendly. All right. So to all the vegans here, I apologize for the next slide. Okay, Charles Spurgeon said this. Charles Spurgeon said, like carcasses cut right down the center, hanging in butcheries, so is God's word piercing to the dividing of soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. That's not all. He goes on to say, it opens up a man and makes him see himself. And I'd like to add, for who he or she really is. That's what God's word does. 